So here's a good one for you. What do you get if you cross a pyramid with a menorah? Absolutely nothing, because a pyramid and a menorah have nothing in common. In fact, they're exact opposites. And what I want to try and explain to you now is why they are opposites. We're in the middle of Hanukkah, we're all having a blast lighting our menorahs. But on the other hand, if we look at the parasha of the week, the story is very much based in Egypt, because Yosef is now the ruler of Egypt, and his brothers have come down to Egypt to buy food. So I want to bring these two ideas together, of Egypt and Hanukkah, by sharing, some with, by sharing some Jewish wisdom that I learned while studying in Israel. It's something that I truly believe can revolutionize our lives. I think the official symbol of Egypt is the pyramid, right? But the pyramid actually contains a lot of deeper symbolism. If we imagine the stone at the top of the pyramid as representing the power, and the stones at the bottom as representing the slaves and peasants, the pharaoh lived lives of comfort and luxury, but the slaves at the bottom lived lives of poverty and hardship. The pharaoh and the noblemen were able to live in comfort. They had everything they wanted, but the peasants were forced to work hard all day for barely any food, and they had to live this way until they died. It doesn't bear thinking about, does it? I don't want to make this too technical, but the pyramid essentially represents inequality. The people at the top living good lives, the people at the bottom living terrible lives. But this unjust power structure represented by the pyramid was not unique to ancient Egypt. If we look back through ancient history, every single ancient people used the pyramid. For example, look at ancient Rome. The emperors and the royal household in ancient Rome were swimming in riches, but it's estimated that around one in five ancient Romans were slaves. In medieval Europe, ruled by the Christian church, society was structured by the feudal pyramid. Most of the population lived as serfs tied to their master's property. They had to work the land all day for practically nothing. Even modern capitalism, while certainly better than feudal Europe, still represents the pyramid because there aren't enough good paying jobs for everyone. Ask your parents. And when trying to get a job, people are forced to compete against each other to get hired by the employers. Meaning the only way I can get a good job is if you don't. So society is very much a pyramid where the few gain the expense of the many and everyone is pitted against each other. But there was one people in the ancient world whose society was very, very different. The Jewish people. Our society is not symbolized by a pyramid, but rather by the menorah. There's a reason this official symbol of the state of Israel is a menorah. It's because the menorah is just about the most Jewish symbol there is. Let's examine the symbolism. In the menorah, all the various branches are different, but they're all the same height, indicating that while no two human beings are exactly the same, Every single person is of equal value, from the, from, from the greatest king to the lowliest peasant. Now, a Jewish leader, be it a rabbi, a judge, or even, or even a Jewish king back in biblical Israel, can be compared to the shamash of the menorah, the central branch raised above the others. Just as the shamash has the responsibility of lighting the other lamps, the role of a Jewish leader is a responsibility to bring out the best in others and help them grow. Perhaps the most powerful difference between the pyramid and the menorah is this. As we've mentioned, in a pyramid, the only way to climb <laughs> higher is by pushing others down. But with a menorah, the goal is to spread as much light as possible. And if you can imagine yourself as a lamp in the menorah, there are two ways to do this. You can strive to increase your own lamp and make it brighter. Or you can reach across to your neighbor who you see is struggling and touch your flame to his until he, or until he or she catches fire. By sharing our flame with others, our own light has not diminished. In fact, it has grown because we have used it to bring more light into the world. What the Torah teaches us is to view every human being like a lamp in the menorah and not like a stone in the pyramid. We are not meant to be fighting each other to climb to the top. Rather, our goal is to use everything we have and to spread as much light as possible. We can do this by both working to improve ourselves and working to help others, which doesn't diminish us, as the pyramid would have us believe, but rather makes us into greater, godlier people. There are so many mitzvot in the Torah which demonstrate this central idea of supporting others and helping others grow. 
For example, when a Jewish farmer harvests the crops in his field, he has to leave some, a, a corner of the field unharvested so that the poor people can come and take food for themselves so they won't go hungry. Also, if you find a lost object that belongs to someone else, you are obligated to go out of your way to make sure they, to make sure they get it back. You have to return it to them. All these mitzvahs and many others are meant to remind us of the Torah's lesson that every human being is of equal worth regardless of how they look on the outside and how our purpose and goal in this world is to help and support each other. This, this message also goes a considerable way in explaining why there's so much anti-Semitism in the world. Can you imagine how this message would have been received by the pagan world? In a world governed by survival of the fittest, where kings were getting rich from the peasants, this message that every human being is of equal value was likely to be seen by the non-Jewish rulers as extremely threatening to their pyramid worldview. Because if we are meant to be helping each other rather than, rather than oppressing each other, the kings have no right to go about exp exploiting the peasants, to go about enslaving them. And this means they lose their source of income. But while they can't attack the author of this message, uh, which is God, they can attack the ones he chose to disseminate it, us, the Jewish people. And they might do this in one of several ways. They might take the path of power and physically enslave us, as we tell over every year at the Pesach Seder. Or they might try to make us forget we're Jews, like Antiochus, the Greek king who stopped us keeping the Torah, saying, assimilate into the popular culture, live a nice life, forget this whole Torah thing. Or they might try to physically kill us, like Haman at the time of the Purim story. Or they might try to convert us to another religion, like the Christians have been attempting to do for 2,000 years. You don't need to keep the Torah, just become a Christian, accept our Messiah, and all your sins will be forgiven. But you know what? Despite all this, we cannot abandon our mission. We cannot abandon the Torah. Why? Because the world needs us. Because without the ideology of the Torah, humanity is doomed. Because no one else can tell the world that we are not stones in a pyramid, but lamps in a menorah. And that mankind's mission is not to exploit those weaker than us, but to, to endeavour to support others and strive to be godly. Now it's okay if not everything I told you just made sense. It was a bit complicated. But before I finish, I want to encourage each and every one of you to incorporate this message of the pyramid versus the menorah into your, into your lives. Firstly, on an individual level. Work on seeing the people around you, your friends, family, work colleagues, even annoying classmates, as lamps in a menorah. What I mean by this is to constantly remind yourself that their success, their victories, don't reduce your victories. Because it's natural to be jealous when others do well. We're all guilty of it to some degree. But if we can learn to see the victories of others as completely independent to our own victories, just as in a menorah, all the lamps shine independently of each other. Then we can stop being jealous of other people, and we can learn to not only be happy when they do well, but to help them do well, without having to worry that it will stop us doing well. This is such a powerful, joyful way to live life, and while I know it's a hard level to reach, I believe with constant effort each and every one of us can get there, and internalise this lesson, and learn to see those around us, no pun intended, in this light. Secondly, to absorb this message on a national level. Remember that we, the Jewish people, have a mission. A mission to tell the world that mankind is here to support each other, to replace the pyramid with the menorah. How do we accomplish our mission? By keeping the Torah, collectively as a people, in its entirety. And each and every Jew is like a cell in a huge spiritual body. Every Jew who lives by the Torah contributes to the health of the body and enables it to better carry out its mission. Certainly, this mission does have its risks. But to be a Jew means so much more than chicken soup and chopped liver. It means being part of the greatest revolution mankind has ever seen. So have you decided? Do you want to be a revolutionary?